Greetings, salutations, and Volkswagens. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Beautiful Lord's Day morning. We've already got a good crowd, and I anticipate the arrival of others through the morning. It's a little bit hectic. We're uh, making preparations and furthering preparations for a big meal together following our morning worship hour, and so we're excited about that, but even more, we're excited about the spiritual feast that we have before us today. It is the Lord's day, we are among the Lord's people, and it's a blessing for us to be here this hour. I'm not going to take much more of our speaker's time. Uh, It's been quite a while. Brother Roger and I talked yesterday over the phone, and it had been longer, I think, than I realized since uh, he has been with us. We're so glad that he and Sister Donna both are with us today, and we're excited about this series that we have set forth. This first hour is going to be the Here in a moment, I'll be turning it over to Brother Roger Campbell. If you would, let's bow together and we'll have a word of prayer and I'll turn it over to him. Father, we praise Thee and we give Thee glory. Father, we rejoice in the beauty of this Lord's Day, but infinitely more than the outward beauty and the weather of this day, we rejoice in the spiritual significance of the first day of the week, Father, the Resurrection Day. And we're so thankful to be here as Your people. We're so thankful for the sacrifice of Christ for His redemptive work and all that He accomplished during His life and during His death and even during His resurrection and ascension, Father. We're so thankful that He ever lives to make intercession for us still today. Father, we do humbly confess our sins. Father, we acknowledge that we fall short of Thy glory. We ask Thy forgiveness. We pray that You'll suffer long with us and that you'll strengthen us daily through thy word and through the fellowship of those of like precious faith so that we might be drawn closer to each other and be drawn closer to thee. Father, we do pause to pray for those of our number who are sick. We know that perhaps many names will be mentioned later today and many names are already reflected in our bulletin prayer lists. Father, you know each name and each need, and we ask for for your blessings and your mercies on each person. Father, we are so thankful for Roger and Donna and for their labors in thy kingdom. Father, we ask thy blessings on Roger this hour and throughout this day. Strengthen him in body and in mind, and bless him as he stands before us to teach thy word. Father, bless us as hearers that we would listen attentively in view of eternity. Father, these favors and blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Cliff said we're on. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, It is a magnificent day on the outside. We look forward to our time together as we study the scriptures and worship the God of heaven. If I'm not mistaken, the last time we were here and I spoke was in 2014. Uh, We are your debtors for the rest of our life. As we spent five years laboring in Southeast nation of Malaysia, and you were one of our supporting churches, and we will forever be grateful for your support of that, and the brethren there are are grateful as well. As the last speaker on a series of lessons, I know my number one objective is not mess up all the good that's been done before we got here. I know that you have been blessed to have lessons together on Friday evening and Saturday evening, and we hope that our studies together will be helpful and encouraging to all of us. 
We, we sometimes start a conversation by asking someone, perhaps in passing, or we're planning to sit down and discuss, well, how's your, how'd your day go? What kind of day did you have? What kind of day are you having? And you know, sometimes the answer might be, well, it, it was all right. It was okay. Other times the answer might be, man, it was good. And it, man, it, it couldn't have gone any better. And then at other times, as we talk about the kind of day we've had or the kind of week we had or the kind of period we're going through, we might say, well, you know, it's, it's been rough. Or we might even say, it's the worst stretch I've faced in my whole life. Not everything in life goes the way that we want it to go. Sometimes things happen that are disappointing, disheartening depressing. Sometimes we feel like someone's punched us in the stomach or something has punched us in the stomach, so to speak. And some of those feelings may be temporary. They may be one and done. Other times the hurt is deep and we may feel like it's never going to go away. And sometimes the pain leaves a scar. Now, now who encounters those types of things? Who has to deal with bad times or bad stretches in life? And the answer is, well, non-Christians face those things, but so do members of God's family. People who've been on this earth for a long time, they face those things. So do middle-aged folks, and so do young people. As we talk today and, and, and throughout our lessons and as you've spoken in the last couple of days about challenges, just this observation. When we use the word challenge, it doesn't mean necessarily that there's a problem. Someone says, I've got a challenging schedule ahead this week. Monday, I've got to be in Mobile and and Tuesday, I've got to be in Montgomery. And Wednesday, I've got to be in Florence. And, and Thursday, I've got to be in Huntsville. Well, it doesn't mean there's a problem. It doesn't mean there's something that's broken and needs to be fixed. It simply means that it's going to take a special effort on my part to be successful in doing the things that I want to do. But as we speak this morning about the challenge to move on in my life after something painful has happened or something hurtful. I think there's a to- this is a topic with which all of us can, can relate. Now, now, the pain that fe- people feel is real. Now, you and I many times are observers as other people are going through rough stretches in life. Sometimes we're the ones going through it. Now, Again, who faces the painful experiences? Well, people of all ages, people of all genders, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Now, here's a 10-year-old boy. Now, you and I, some of us as old-timers, look at this 10-year-old boy, and we see his response, and we smile and say, well, he'll get over it. But here's this 10-year-old boy, the championship game of his little league season. He's up to bat three times. He strikes out three times. He drops two fly balls. And he is devastated that his team didn't win and he played the worst game that he can remember. He's devastated. He goes on and a few years later is in the eighth grade and he's met this young girl and he thinks, man, she could be the one for life and she decides that they're not going to be boyfriend and girlfriend anymore. Guess what? He's devastated. Now, as you and I are onlookers of that, We might smile, say, been there, done that, you'll get over it. But you know what? His pain is real. And then his high school senior, he takes the ACT, he he has his grade index, and he's had this college in mind. He's wanted his entire life, he wanted to go to that college. Well, you know what? He didn't have the scores, he didn't have the grades. He's devastated. Now, now those young people's pain is real. Perhaps someone is facing some health issues. There's bo- things are going on in their body that have never happened before in their life. And it's tough. 
Or maybe they're a caregiver for someone who's going through that. It's a painful experience. Or, or, or another family through no fault of their own, they're facing financial crisis week in and week out. And it's a challenge. Not simply to keep their head above water, but to keep their mental state as a Christian where it needs to be. Students, they, they face the challenge of, of painful experiences. The rest of us who are, are in, in the working class or those of us who are retired, or whatever, we, we, we face those challenges, but the pain is real. And I not even mention the one we often think about, and that is the loss of a loved one. Whether the loss of our mother came unexpectedly, we, we call it an untimely death, or the loss of our mother came after she'd been in a special assisted facility. She'd lived there for 20 years. It's a painful experience. And so we hope as we mature as a Christian and we observe what other people are facing, we hope that we will be sympathetic. And if it's something with which we can relate, we hope we will learn to be empathetic. That There's a an instruction in 1 Peter chapter 3. In, in, the, in the opening section of 1 Peter 3, you've got instruction for wives and then instruction for husbands. And then flowing out of that, you've got instructions that would apply to all Christians in all scenarios. But, but in 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and verse number 8, verse number 8, the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Let me pause for just a moment and say, if you're looking at the Greek word, it would be supertheis. And if you printed that word over and over, it sounds like our English word sympathy. So, so the idea of their compassion one for another is the idea of, of sympathy. And then love as brethren, be pitiful or be courteous. The New King James just said be pitiful has be tender hearted. And there is the idea of being able to feel what people are going through. And so as we observe our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our friends, our classmates, our coworkers, as we see them facing painful experiences in life, you and I may look at those things and say, look, this is, this is, this is going to pass. It's, it's, it's temporary. You'll get over this. But when they're facing pain, you know what? Their pain is real. And we need to be supportive of them. Now, what about some Bible characters? Now, this is not an exhaustive list. You know that. Were there any Bible characters about whom we read in Old Testament times or first century times who, who faced painful experiences? And yes. Isn't that part of the human experience is to have painful experiences? It's not one that we cherish. It's not one we get out of bed in the morning and say, I just can't wait to have some hurtful experience. We, we don't look forward to them. But it's part of the human experience. You think about Abraham. Abraham lost his beloved Sarah. Now, we're not told exactly when they married, but when they left Haran, came into the land of Canaan, Abraham, if I'm not mistaken, was 75, which made Sarah 65. And she died at the age of 127. Real quickly, people up here up front. If she 127 when they died, 65 when she entered the land of Canaan, they'd been married last how many years? Hello. <laughs> they'd been married at least six decades. And when she died, Abraham went to the sons of Heth and said, I need to buy a bearing plot. And, and you know, it was a cave of Machpelah. And he said, here's why that I may bury my dead out of my sight. In modern language, we talk about that getting closure. But you can hear the, the emotion. You, you can feel the emotion in Abraham's words when he said, I've got to have a burying plot so I can bury my dead out of my sight. 
a minimum of 60 plus years together as husband and wife. Was that a painful experience? Well, of course it was. That same book of Genesis, Joseph, betrayed by his brother, sold into slavery, lied about by Mrs. Potiphar, wrongfully imprisoned, all of those things. Did he face trials in his life, things that were unpleasant? He surely did. Job. Job's kind of the one we think up there. He's at the, the top of the scale, right, in terms of going through difficulties. Job wouldn't claim to be the only one in history who went through hard times, but in one day's time, he lost thousands of head of livestock and all ten of his children. The pain of losing one loved one, sometimes it feels overwhelming. Can you imagine one and then another, 10 in one day's time. And yet Job is so well known and the Bible uses that terminology. In James chapter five, as James is appealing to the Christians of the first century to be patient in the sense of endurance and perseverance, he said, think about the patience of Job. It's not just a term, y'all. It's not just something for a bumper sticker there genuinely was the endurance and the perseverance of Job. Moses. There's one chapter, that come, one Bible chapter that comes to mind to me in the life of Moses that was painful experience after painful experience after painful experience. It's Numbers chapter 20. It was the 40th year of the children of Israel in the wilderness, and the first verse says that in the first month, Miriam died. So he lost his older sister. The next section in Numbers 20 is the Bible's record of God's instruction for Moses to get the people together and speak to the rock in front of the people so they could have water. He didn't do that. As a result, God said, you're not going into the land of Canaan. So he lost his sister. He lost his right to enter the land of Canaan. Before you get to the end of chapter 20, in the fifth month of the 40th year, he lost his older brother, Moses. You talk about a rough patch. Lost his sister lost his right to enter the land of Canaan, and lost his brother. Moses was familiar with painful experiences. Naomi, because of famine in the land of Israel, Naomi and her family moved to the land of Moab, and in the course of time, which family members did Naomi lose? Lost her husband, lost her two sons. She came back to Bethlehem, accompanied by Ruth, and when she got back there, she said, don't call me Naomi. And the margin of my Bible under Naomi, I believe, says pleasant. She said, call me Mara, which means bitter. She said, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. She struggled with a bitter spirit. Naomi was familiar with hard times. David, and you think about David, some of his hard times, some of those were self-inflicted. <coughs> After his debacle with Bathsheba and the things that played out in his life, he faced challenge after challenge, and a lot of those were, were self-inflicted wounds. But, but the point is, David, even as the sweet singer of Israel, and all of those uplifting and edifying and upbeat psalms, David was familiar with painful experiences. Peter, the night our Lord was betrayed, Peter three times denied him, and on the third time, there was eye contact between Peter and Jesus. And the Bible says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Luke 22 and verse 62. Peter was, in our language, devastated because of what he'd done. And you have to wonder. I'm just thinking out loud. You have to wonder for the rest of his life Every time that Peter heard a rooster, would there have been that unsolicited, natural cringe and response? He had to live with that for the rest of his life. And then the Apostle Paul, not in a context where Paul is at all complaining, but in 2 Corinthians 11, that's one of the passages in which Paul, beginning in verse 23, gives a reference to some of the things that he'd experienced 
shipwreck beatings. It's in that context. He said, I've been whipped on five different occasions with 39 lashes. I've been in prison. I've, been, I've, I've faced all these things. Paul was not exempt from painful experiences. The church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul, Paul says, look, you're carnal. I wish I could speak to you as if you were spiritual. You're carnal. He said, here's the evidence. You've got envy. You've got strife and division. That doesn't mean that every single person was involved in that, but just imagine, you're a member of that congregation. You're not a participant in the envy, strife, and division, but you certainly feel it, and you're certainly aware of it, and you certainly have to live with it. It's a horrible experience to deal with a congregation that is torn asunder from within. And then we'll close with the church in Smyrna. I'm thinking about Revelation chapter 2. If I were to ask you this morning to quote part of a verse from the book of Revelation, my thought is if this is standard congregation A, most brethren would think about perhaps Revelation 2.10b. 2.10b. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll what? Give thee a crown of life. But in that same verse, before you get to that familiar wording for us, Jesus basically said to the church in Smyrna, here's what lies on your horizon. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to suffer. Those are Bible words. Trial, tribulation, suffer. Some of y'all are going to prison for 10 days. And in that setting, in that context, you be faithful unto death and I'll give thee the crown of life. The, the New Testament teaches God wants us to be faithful until the end of our lives. But it seems to me that the meaning of Revelation 2 and verse 10 is way more than that. It is if your suffering and tribulation, imprisonment and torture, even if you have to give your life for my sake, even if you have to die for me, you need to be faithful even to that point. So what do we conclude from this? These Bible characters, all well known to us, they experience painful things in life. You know why? Not because they're Bible characters. <laughs> Because they were humans, which is a reminder of those of us who come along thousands of years later, we're not the first and we won't be the last to experience painful things. Well, what are some unhealthy responses when we go through something painful? Well, we need to avoid feeling sorry for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with reaching out to others and communicating what we're facing. But it's not a time for us to feel sorry for ourselves. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, the picture there is just as gold is tested by fire, so our faith is tested by what? Trials. And over later in chapter 4, I think it's about verse 12 or 13, Peter uses the language, a fiery trial. How do we find out under what circumstances do we find out what kind of faith we have? And the answer is not when things are going smoothly. We're, we're not suggesting when things are going smoothly you can't have a strong faith. But we really find out what kind of faith we have and how committed we are when we're facing challenges. There's a statement in the book of Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 10 that says this. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now that statement sometimes may hit us right between the eyes. If you faint, if you grow weary in the day of adversity, then your strength is small. When I read that statement, my mind naturally goes to something that God said to Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah chapter 12. Where, where God said to Jeremiah, he was somewhat disheartened by what he was observing in Judah. And God said, if you grow weary with the footman, how are you going to 
going to keep up with the horses? How are you going to keep up when, when the waters of the Jordan overflow? In other words, if you're struggling in this matter which is smaller, how are you going to deal with the floodgates being open and, and more and more challenged? So let, let's not feel sorry for ourselves. Number two, let's not isolate ourselves. Now, I understand we all have different personalities. Some of us are more outgoing. Some of us are more introverted. Some of us are more bubbly. Some of us are more keep it to ourselves. So we're not saying change your character, change your personality. But it's not healthy for us to cut off everyone and everybody and isolate ourselves when we're going through trials. Is it helpful in some cases, to have some R&R &R and to get away. Yeah, Jesus said to the apostles, after they'd been out preaching, he said, let's go apart to a separate place. He said, in the King James language, he said, let's come apart and rest. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. So there's a time for rest. The old preacher said it this way, based on the King James. He said, there are times in life you can either come apart and rest or you can just come apart. <laughs> so, so there's something to be said for time off, change of scenery, whatever. But think about Elijah. Think about an instance in the life of the prophet, prophet Elijah when he was down. I'm thinking about after that victory at Mount Carmel at the peak of the mountain, literally <coughs> victorious over the false prophets, Somebody put the word out. Somebody put a mark on Elijah's life. He, he's a dead man. Who was it? Remember? Jezebel. And Elijah was disheartened. And in simple language, as God communicated with Elijah, he said, Son, I got things for you to do. You need to get back involved, you need to get back to serving. You've had your temporary time, but don't totally isolate yourself, Elijah. He said, go and anoint this man as king of Syria. Go and anoint Jehu as king of Israel. Go and anoint Elisha to be a prophet. So th there was a time when Eli Elijah took a time out. But God basically said, look, it's not healthy for you to totally isolate yourself. You need to get back and be involved. You know, sometimes when bad things happen in life, our first thought is it's somebody's fault. I got to blame this on somebody. Well, you know, sometimes in life things happen and someone is to blame for that. But even if you and I can, can identify the source of what happened, who, who caused that, does that really remove the pain? No, not really. At some point, we're going to realize in life, even if someone is at fault, if somebody's not at fault, suffering and hurting is part of, of the human experience. But here's one we really want to notice. We don't want to go off on God. Isn't that the response some people have? When something in life unpleasant happens, they had their mind set on something and, and they didn't receive it. They didn't achieve it. They're disappointed. Well, why wouldn't God give that to me? I've been serving Him for these many years the best I know. Why, why wouldn't God give that to me? Or I asked God to extend my spouse's life. All I asked for was two more months and, and, and He didn't even get two days. Going off on God, that's never the right response in any situation. Let me ask you this. Did the Father, God the Father, love His Son Jesus? Yes, He did. Did Jesus, during His earthly journey, experience painful things? And the answer is yes. Yes. Should Jesus, because of those painful experiences, should Jesus have begun to doubt the Father's love for him and go off on the Father because he wasn't there? Absolutely not. 
And so that example reminds us that even though God loves us, that does not exempt us from pain and challenges in life. We mentioned a minute ago the Apostle Paul and things that he went through. We did not mention that unique language that he used in describing what he faced. He said, I got this thorn in the flesh. And he said, not once, not twice. He said, three times I entreated the Lord to remove that thorn, whatever it was. And God's response, the way it played out, God's response basically was, the thorn stays. Paul's thinking was, boy, my life would be a lot better if I didn't deal with this thorn. God said, son, the thorn stays. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9. Going off on God is never the right answer. What is it says in Philippians 2 and verse 14, let all things be done without murmuring or complaining. Not always an easy thing to do, but going off on God is not the right thing. And then sometimes people who have been with the Lord decide it's in their best interest simply to call it quits. Think about John chapter 6. To me, this is just me speaking. To me, one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible is John 6 and verse 66. Jesus had spoken in a synagogue in Capernaum about himself as the bread of life. And the Bible says, after that message, many, M-A-N-Y, many of his disciples went away and walked with him no more. To me, that's one of the saddest statements in the whole Bible. Now, not one... Not a couple. Not not just people who'd been listening in every now and then to his message. Genuine disciples. Many of them decided the best choice for their life was to leave the Lord. That's never the right response. You say, well, just some things in life I don't understand. None of us understand everything in life. It was on that occasion Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You know what that was? That was perspective. That didn't take away the trials. That didn't take away the pain. So so those are five. If you were to come up with a list, you, you would probably have some different ones. And if I were to start with a list tomorrow, I may have five different. But those are some unhealthy responses. Now, what can help me to move on? Oh. Do I have all the answers? I do not. Number one is perspective. And you know, when we're in the heat of the moment, so to speak, perspective is not always our strongest suit, right? But if I could somehow step back and ask myself, one year from now, five years from now, Am I going to look, if I'm still alive, am I going to look back on this and say this was something really, really big or maybe not so big? Okay. Something happened. We just put new carpet in the living room. One of the grandkids was over there and they thought that that light colored carpet needed some cherry Kool Aid all over it. Well, it's unfixable. It's painful. It was expensive. I don't want to go through that mess again. Well, a year from now or five years from now, you know what? May look back with a smile. But perspective, yeah, try to keep it in perspective with this thought. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians 4 and verse 4. Go to the Lord. Go to the Lord. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. We're to cast our cares on him. What's the reason? What's it say? He cares for you. I don't know if it's in the songbook we use here at Ironiton, but there's an old song way back last century when I was a kid we used to sing. I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but the song was, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Anybody know that song? Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. So I don't want to burden God. Listen. God said, I want to hear about it. Bring it all 
to me. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, the writer's been talking about Jesus as our high priest. and He said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, think about some of those words, and they're not very big words in English. In time of need, and when we're hurting, we're in need. In time of need, come to the throne of grace that you might receive grace, mercy, and help. When we face painful experience, that's time to go to the Lord. Time to trust in Him. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 and verse number 31. Go to the Scriptures. Now I'm going to mention a verse that we often quote in reference to the Old Testament. And I understand why. It's Romans 15 and 4. Somebody get me going here. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were what? written for our learning. And that's where our emphasis often is, and I get it. But what's the rest of the verse say? For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That purpose, we through what? Patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The Scriptures provide comfort. The Scriptures provide hope. When we were talking a minute ago about an unhealthy response is to isolate ourselves, we were talking mainly about isolating ourselves from other people. Same principle. Be the, an unhealthy response to the troubles in life is isolating ourselves from the Lord. No, that's a time to take up a notch. Our communication with the Lord in prayer and allowing Him to communicate with us. Communicate with others. Now, I'm just... I, let me explain this. I, I didn't want to use up half the chart explaining what I meant. I'm talking about here sometimes we might find it helpful with people who have been through the same experience to open up with them and, and learn, well, how did you deal with this? How, how did, what did you find helpful? I remember a number of years ago there was a family congregation with which we were working and, and uh, Young woman was having some, some issues. She made a public confession, and, and her grandmother came out after services, and she said, Roger, she said, I hurt so much today. She said, but other people have been through this and gotten through it, and we will too. Sometimes it's helpful to communicate with others and, and learn from them. Take it one day at a time. Now, that's true with a lot of things in life. You know, when Jesus was teaching about worry, what we find in Matthew 6, you know, Jesus was the master teacher, and one of the things Jesus used as a method of teaching was repetition. And then our Bible's in, beginning in Matthew 6, 24, or 6, 25, to the end of the chapter in 10 verses at least three times, we have the wording of Jesus. The King James language is take no thought. The New King James is don't worry. And the last verse there in, in, in Matthew 6 don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have its own troubles. <laughs> What's the point? One day at a time. You know, sometimes our mind begins to race ahead and say, well, look, I'm dealing with it. I don't know if I can face the rest of my life. I don't, I'm, I'm 35 years old. On average, people are going to live till they're 75 or 80 minimum. How am I going to deal with this the rest of my life for 50 years? One day at a time. That's the same thing we'd say to a person that's 20 years old who just obeyed the gospel and they know they've got some rough times ahead because of their circumstances. I don't think I can be faithful for 60 years. Don't worry about 60 years. Don't worry about a period. Just one day at a time. Recall how blessed I am. Sometimes the human mind focuses on painful experiences, bad stuff, more than it does good stuff. I can't explain it. It's just the way it is. If you were to ask me the score of every high school football game I lost, I can tell you the score of every game I lost. 
I'm not sure I can do half of the games I want. That's the way the human mind is sometimes. I'm not saying that we should say to ourselves, the pain I'm feeling, that's ah, nothing, just count your blessing. I remember a family that had four children, and they lost one of their children. He's about 30 years of age. And one of the sons spoke to his mom and said, Mom, you still got three of us. And, you know, she was basically, you don't understand a mother's love. You don't understand the hole in my heart. Let me, let me suggest this to you. If you're going through right now an experience that's so painful, you don't know how you're going to endure it. Take out a piece of paper, whatever size you want. Pee-wee, huge. I'm not asking you to make a list of 55 blessings. Write down three blessings. Three blessings you have in your life. And when you're done with that, give yourself another challenge. Write down three more. And if you can, do it again. That doesn't take away the pain, but it's a reminder of how blessed we are. Think about how wonderful heaven's going to be. You know what there's not going to be in heaven? There won't be any of this worrying about tomorrow in heaven. There won't be any of this, how am I going to endure this another day? There won't be any pain. There won't be any sorrow. There won't be any scars. There's reserve. What is it in 1 Peter chapter 1? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us and given us a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance. Here it comes now. The hope is identified to an inheritance. What's it say? What are the adjectives? Y'all help me out. That's... Well, I'm not to, I, I was, thought I could get by and you'd tell me, so I, I can't remember what it says. Incorruptible. What else? Undefiled. Fades not away. Reserved in heaven. Reservations. And so, again, that doesn't take away the pain, but keeping our sights on that, it can help us through it. And then finally, remember this. Being content. It's a choice. Book of Philippians chapter 4. And when you think about the book, book of Philippians, what word comes to mind? Joy, rejoicing, right? Anybody remember what were Paul's personal circumstances in life when he wrote the book of Philippians? Anybody remember? Where was he at that time? Prison in Rome. And it's there in Philippians 4, beginning about verse 10 or 11, he uses the language that to me is a real eye-opener. He didn't say, I was born content. He said, I've learned. I've learned to be content. Whatever state I'm in, I'm talking about Georgia or Alabama, whatever state, whatever circumstance, whether my cup's overflowing or whether there's nothing in the cup, he said, I've learned to be content. How can a man in prison, wrongfully imprisoned, beaten those five times with 39 lashes when he was innocent of, of, of violating the law. How could a man like that be content? Answer, he chose to be. Because he knew contentment is not based on physical circumstances. It's based on a relationship with the creator of the universe. In a nutshell, here's what we looked at today, y'all. The pain people feel is real. We looked at some Bible characters and the pain they faced and some unhealthy responses and what can help me move on. May God help us to be there for each other. To be a source of comfort and encouragement. And as we're the ones who are going through it, to have the right spirit and set the right example. Appreciate your kind attention.
Good morning. It's so good to see this fine number here on this Lord's Day. If you were with us during our auditorium class, my, how we have already been blessed spiritually here today. We're thankful for that, and we're looking forward to the continuation of these services together. If you would, take a songbook and be opening to number 174. 174 will be our first song this morning. Brother Brad Collins will be our song leader today. At the appropriate time, our opening prayer will be led by Brother Mickey Haney. Our closing prayer at the end of services will be led by Brother Michael Brewer. Michael, of course, we would ask that you lead us in giving thanks for the food, especially at that time. And then our Lord's Supper observance today will be presided over by Brother Pete Ward and Brother C.J. Johnson, also at the appropriate time. Two housekeeping matters. First of all, if you're visiting with us today, we love visitors here at Ironiton. We want you to feel welcome in every way, and we hope you'll come back. But if you will, look to the back of the pew in front of you, and you'll notice some white visitors' cards, rectangular white cards. Uh, go ahead presently and take one of those out and be filling out that visitors' card for us, if you would. And at the close of services, simply leave it lying in one of the pews, or even better, uh, find one of our members and hand it to them, if you would. And that way we can have a record of your being with us today as our guest. Another housekeeping matter, uh, your cell phones. We know and understand that we often use our cell phones for maybe Bible apps and things like that. Uh, we just ask if you would please to make sure that somehow it is silenced. And then that way, even if we're using it in our study, that hopefully it will not go off and be a disruption. So please look to that for us if you would. Okay, card group number one. The list and the cards will be in the auditorium here today following our morning worship hour. And so basically, as I understand it, all during our lunch break, the uh, cards and the list, that rolling cart with which you're well familiar, it will be in here during the lunch break. And uh, because of our lectureship and because of the special uh, circumstances, what we're doing is we're, we're telling card group, group one to feel free to take the list and the cards today, and if you'd like to bring them home and work on them, simply bring them back Wednesday of this week, and uh, David and Laura Powell, they can take those cards from you Wednesday night. So that's card group one for today. And also, in conjunction with our card ministry, uh, we want to thank you for those who are gathering contacts for us as you know, from time to time, there are new names added on the whiteboard next door where our card groups meet, and we appreciate that. We need to ask, if you will, in conjunction with bringing those names in, uh, also submit those names and addresses to Dale or Sherry Harris, and then that way we can make sure that they're added to our database and that they are uh, put on the appropriate list for the month. And so please, as you do that, uh, keep passing that along also to Dale or Sherry. Okay, I have a few more announcements, but they can be reserved until our closing remarks. If you're with us today, you know that this is our winter lectureship. Our speaker for all three uh, sessions today is Brother Roger Campbell. Uh, he and Sister Donna have recently moved down to our area. They're now living in the Tallapoosa, Georgia area. And uh, we're so, I'm so thankful, I know, to have them uh, close by and in our area. And he's going to speak at the appropriate time this hour on the challenge to keep first things first in our busy lives. How we need that. So Brother Roger Campbell will stand before us at the appropriate time. I'm going to turn the services over now to Brad Collins. As Cliff mentioned, number 174, Higher Ground. I'd ask if you would please at this time, let's stand as we sing this song. Uh, 
I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, I faith on heaven's table. Be seated, please. And before our prayer, number 810, number 810, till the storm passes by.
Bow and pray with me, please. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, Father, we're so thankful unto thee for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us and for this opportunity that we have to assemble together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're so thankful for the avenue of prayer by which we can make our petitions known unto you, Father, knowing that you are faithful and just and you're there to hear our prayers. Father, help us to realize as Christians that we're not guaranteed life without pain, without suffering, without loss. But Father, help us to know that we have a way to deal with these things through prayer, through a study and reflection of your word. Father, thank you so much for Brother Campbell being with us today. We pray, Father, that he has prepared lessons in, that is such that will help us to live our Christian lives in such a way that is pleasing unto you. Father, we pray that we would pay attention today to the things that he has to say and apply them to our lives and be better Christians. Father, be with those who are mentioned here that are sick, and we pray, Father, that they would soon be restored back to their needed and wanted health. And Father, as we enter into this service now, we pray that you would watch over us and please forgive us of sins that we have in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You please mark number 867. 867. Lord, I'm coming home. That'll be our song of invitation at the conclusion of the lesson. What I noticed was nobody came up here to preach, so I said, I'll do it. <laughs> Isn't it great to be a Christian? Amen. If I were to ask you this morning, without raising a hand or writing down an answer or speaking out loud, if I were to ask you this morning, do you feel like your life is pretty busy? I think most of us, regardless of our age, most of us would say, well, yeah, I stay pretty busy. There would be some among us who would say, busy? Well, busy doesn't do it justice. There's a word that someone has coined to call the rat race that we sometimes face an every day a thon. Busy, busy, busy. Does that describe your life? Describes a lot of our lives. Some people are busy in, in work-related activities. Their job is demanding. We sometimes say that person is consumed with his or her work, and it can take its toll. Other people are in, in, involved in busy, busy with family activities, wholesome activities. Dad's got a schedule. Mom's got a schedule. The kids have their schedule, and every schedule seems packed, and it can feel exhausting. Students are busy. Those of us who are in the workforce, we're busy. Retirees are busy. A couple and their children have left home, they're busy. But they're not busy. That couple has three teenagers still living at home. We all have busyness in our lives. And what we want to talk about this morning is the challenge to keep first things first in our busy lives. The question is not, are we going to be busy? Well, we're going to be busy in one fashion or another. You know, we've got devices. We've got gadgets and gizmos that are supposed to be time savers. And a lot of us will look at our lives and look, reflect on our past life and say, it feels like I'm busier now than I've ever been in my life. I got these time savers, but I'm so busy. And so we want to talk in this session this morning, the challenge to keep first things first in our busy lives. Well, let's first identify 
first things first. Because for a non-Christian, when they talk about first things first, they may have something entirely different in mind than a Christian has when she or he talks about first things first. Just taking the word first in our English Bible, the, the word first is part of the teaching of the old covenant. For, for instance, the children of Israel, the, the final plague of the ten plagues in Egypt was the death of the firstborn. Firstborn in the, among the families uh, and the firstborn among the livestock. And you read in Numbers chapter 13, you read about it again, I'm sorry, Exodus 13 and Numbers 3 about this reality under the old law, the firstborn, firstborn among the Israelites was to be dedicated to the Lord. That doesn't mean that parents were ought to offer their oldest child as a sacrifice. But that oldest child was to be redeemed. Literally, a price was to be paid. But, but that child was identified as firstborn, in other words, belongs to the Lord. Same thing for the firstborn among their livestock. So there was their firstborn. What about the term first fruit or first fruits? At the time of gathering in the harvest, the first portion of the harvest was to go to whom? Go to God. Well, what if it looks like we're going to have a, a smaller harvest this year? I'm not sure if there's going to be enough. If I give God the first fruits, I'm not sure if there's going to be enough to take care of my family and have seed for next year. God said, I want the first fruits. So it was his firstborn dedicated to the Lord. There were first fruits offered to the Lord. You remember the children of Israel when they entered the land of Canaan? The first city with which they did battle was the city of Jericho. And God said the spoils of that city... They go to the treasury of Jehovah. They're not for your personal consumption. Joshua 6, 19. We might call that the first spoils of the land of Canaan. They went to the Lord God. During the last week of Jesus' life, a man came and asked him a question. He said in the law, speaking about the law of Moses, he said, what is the first and great commandment. And in his response, Jesus did not say there's no such thing as first commandment. The question was not, what's the first commandment that was spoken? The question had to deal with first commandment, is there any that takes priority? And I'm reading from the account in Mark chapter 12. Jesus said the first of all, command, all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And so those Israelites that drew up in, grew up in that Israelite culture, educated and trained in the law of Moses, they were familiar with the concept of first things first. Firstborn children and livestock, first fruits of the harvest, first spoils in the land of Canaan, and the first commandment. Well, under the new covenant, we have the concept of first. Now, it may not always be the word first, but the concept is there. For a child of the living God, our first target, our first goal in life is when this life is over to make certain that our final destination is what? Heaven. And so Jesus' exhortation to his followers was strive the idea of even to the point of agonizing, put forth the effort, strive to enter the straight or the narrow gate. So there's going to be a lot of folks who want to go in but not be able to. Luke 13 and verse 24. So as you and I look at the prospect of entering the narrow gate, Jesus said what it's going to take is striving, agonism, even if you have to agonize. We spoke this morning about 
John chapter 6 and the sadness of many of Jesus' disciples going away and walking with them. No more earlier in that chapter, up in John chapter 6. Now, if you remember the setting, Jesus' message about himself as the bread of life in that synagogue in Capernaum took place the day after he had fed about 5,000 men on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Fed about 5,000 men plus women and children. That night walked on the sea and then the next day he's over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and those people the day before who had come across, they'd seen him feed that great multitude with food and Jesus gave this exhortation. He said, look, don't labor. Don't labor for the food or the meat that perishes. Labor rather for the meat or the food that endures unto life everlasting. John 6, 27. Now, let, let's pause and make this observation. When Jesus said, don't labor for food that would be fit for physical consumption, he's not saying, don't work so you can have something to eat. We know from other passages, the Lord expects us to work to provide for ourselves. What Jesus was doing was, rather than put the emphasis only on physical labor, physical reward, physical body, rather than do that, put the emphasis, make the spiritual food, laboring for that, your priority. And in our language of February 5th, 2023, it is 2023, right? February 5th, 2023, we would say, First things first. Or we think about Colossians chapter 3. Paul writing to the saints in Colossae, and the language beginning in, in Colossians 3 and verse 1 is, if ye then be risen with Christ. That doesn't mean are you or not risen with Christ. He's not doubting. He's not questioning. The word if there means because. Because. You've been raised to walk in newness of life with the Christ. If then you be risen with Christ, what do you do? Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Christians are seekers. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19 verse 10. When Jesus was 12 years old and his parents left him behind, they went to seek Jesus. Jesus' parable of the pearl of great price, no, the, rather not the pearl of great price, the hidden treasure, the man was seeking. It's the same word. Christians are to be those who are seeking things above. And then verse 2 of Colossians 3, set your affections or set your mind, set your heart on things above not on things of the earth. Young people, used to be young people. That doesn't mean when we're driving a vehicle we can be careless and not paying attention because my sights are set on heaven. No, no, please pay attention. <laughs> please pay attention. But first things first. Our bodies, let me ask you a question. True or false? Living on this earth, we have needs. That's true. Remember what Jesus, we were talking this morning, Jesus in that context saying, don't worry, he says, your father knows you have need of these things. We have needs. We're blessed that God fulfills those and provides for our needs. But the priority, the first things first of Colossians 3 is setting our affections on things above. And then you knew at some point we were going to look at Matthew chapter 6. Again, it's that context of not worrying. Jesus said, you look around at the unbelievers, you look around at the Gentiles, they've chewed their fingernails down to the nub because they're worried about what? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Those things that you and I would, would frequently categorize as what? Daily necessities of life. And here in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 31, therefore take no thought or worry not, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, 
For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Somebody said, I don't get it. If we need those things, why is it so bad if we worry about those things? What's, why is it so bad if we worry about those things being provided? Well, earlier in the context, Jesus said, look, the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, they don't go to psychologists. They don't have psychiatric wards, people needing assistance. Who takes care of them? The creator of the universe. And we're of so much more value than sparrows and daffodils. Jesus said, your father would take care of it. And then you see the contrast in verse 33. But, that's a contrast, right? In contrast to the Gentiles who are fretting and losing sleep and having relationships broken up and having ulcers concerned only about the physical material things of life, he said, that's not the way we want it in the kingdom. But in contrast to that, you seek, there's that word again, there's effort, there's commitment. You seek, and then there's our word first, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It goes without saying, friends, as you and I study the entirety of the Bible, our reasoning in serving the Lord Jesus and putting his affairs first in our life is not simply so we make sure we got food on the table, clothes on our back, and a roof over our head. Those are things about which the Lord Jesus said, we've got those things covered. But that's not why we serve Jesus. Yeah, let me say this. That's not why we ought to serve him. That ought not to be the reason. But it's first things first. And you know, the devil doesn't have to get us in order for us to be eaten out of the devil's hand, so to speak. In order for the devil to be successful in our lives, he doesn't have to get us to go off into false religion. He doesn't have to get us to be involved in rampant immorality. He doesn't have to get us to blaspheme the name of God. He doesn't have to get us to quit attending Bible class and worship. All he has to do is to get us distracted and put our focus on material things instead of spiritual and get our first things first all out of whack. That's all he's got to do. Now let's take a look here. Be on guard against... Priority. And that, that's not a very good way to say it, but I didn't want to use half the screen. What we're saying is be on guard against things which could hinder us from keeping first things first. If you've got a Bible, look with me in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Jesus was a fabulous teacher. The best in history, you better believe it. And, and one of his teaching devices was parables. A story that people could relate to of an earthly activity. And inside that story, there was some type of spiritual lesson that he wanted to bring. And there may be multiple lessons, but with each parable, it's probably a good idea to search for the main point. Well, one of his most well-known stories was what he called the parable of the sower. And that's recorded in three chapters of the Bible. It's recorded in Matthew 13, Luke 8, and Mark 6. But as Jesus explained that parable, you know, this man goes out and he sows seed, and that seed falls into four different types of soil. Well, the third type of soil, that thorny soil, if you look there in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh 
unfruitful. Now, before we leave this verse, let me, let me just add this thought. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, there's another element of this, and there the terminology is the pleasures of life. What happens? These things come. Here, here's a follower of Jesus. And the mentality has changed. This is soil that has great potential. It has great potential to be fruitful. But it cannot bear the fruit that we're wanting it to bear when it has all the thorns. Those thorns are preventing that. And Jesus said, you've got the cares of the world, the deceitful, and written the lust of other things, the pleasures of life. Sometimes things that in and of themselves are wholesome activities, if we're not careful, we will give so much focus and so much attention to those things that before you know it, sometimes we don't even notice. We may be the last ones to notice what others already have noticed. We no longer have the right things. First things first. Second Timothy chapter 2. Paul to George Timothy and says, you, you endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He didn't say because you're a child of God, you're exempt from hardness and suffering. He says, you endure those things. And then he went on to say that, that no man who's a soldier, in order to please the one who's called him to be a soldier in this world, he doesn't want to allow himself or allow herself to become what? Entangled with the affairs of this life. Someone who's soldiering to represent her or his nation. When they're on the front lines, when they're holding the line, when they're protecting the nation, you and I, as those whom they're defending and protecting, we're sure enough hoping they're not out there checking the recent ball scores and stock market. We want them focused on the task at hand. And what can happen in life is like that thorny soil. We can put so much emphasis and spend so much time and invest so much energy in earthly material activities that may be good and, and helpful that our tank is empty. And we feel like we don't have anything else to give the Lord. We're familiar with the language, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 11 is this chapter about how these great men and women of the Old Testament era, they weren't perfect, but they had a pattern of living by faith. And the whole point of the chapter is, you and I can live by faith too. And he says, now in this race, chapter 12 and verse 1, wherefore seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience or some versions say endurance the race that's set before us. Here, here's a picture of a race. I don't think we're looking at a hundred yard dash. But from the time of conversion till the time we leave this world or at least at this point, from this point in their Christian life till the time they leave this world, it's like this life is pictured as a race. And he said in order to be successful in the race, and we're not in competition, in order to be successful in the race, to run at your best, you need to remove the weights and the sin that so easily besets or ensnares us. Sometimes we become so involved in earthly activity, not things that are simple, things that in and of themselves are wholesome, maybe helpful. We become so fatigued with those that we feel like we got nothing left in our tank to run the race that really matters. And Satan's appeal says, you know, if you want to be a happy person, the key to being a happy person is money, money, money. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, here's this warning. 
those who desire to be rich. It's not talking about being rich. It's those who put their emphasis on being rich in a material sense. Those who desire to be rich, they, they fall into a snare. They're facing perdition. And then that's where he comes in with that statement we're more, more familiar with in verse 10. The love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all or all kinds of evil. But Satan will use that pull. So young people, middle-aged people, old timers like myself, one of our challenges is in our busy, busy lives, in our pursuit of prosperity, in our pursuit of pleasure, in our pursuit of whatever it is, we must not allow those pursuits to become our main focus in life. Even for those things that are lawful, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul said all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. In other words, the things that are acceptable, maybe not all of those are in my best interest. And then he made this conclusion. Even though they're lawful, he said, I won't be brought under the power of any of them. Country language, 21st century, Paul said, I won't become an addict. That hobby of mine, in which I invest time and money, it's just a hobby. But I'm not going to let that be what determines who I am now. Some signs that our super business is affecting us. Let me mention a few. If I see in my life that I am so busy with stuff that that is affecting my personal Bible study time, then I need to make an adjustment. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 4. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. As newborn babes, what? Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. My spiritual growth in part is going to come about by investing time in studying the scriptures. And if I eliminate that from my life or I drastically reduce that from my life or when I come to do that, I'm so exhausted I get to verse 3 and I'm asleep. So let's go back to verse 1. By the time I get to verse 3, I'm asleep. If my personal Bible study time is being affected by my busyness, I need to pump the brakes and make some type of adjustment. Let's think about communication in the other direction. If I'm so busy that I feel like I have no time for or I'm just not able to make time for prayer, I need to pump the brakes and make an adjustment. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul writing again as a prisoner in Rome writes to the saints in Colossae. And part of his message in Colossians 4 is about prayer. In verse number 2, the message is continue in prayer. So prayer is not a one and done. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. The New King James says being vigilant. That means I'm on guard and I'm protecting my communication time with God. I'm protecting my time to let him talk to me through his word, and I'm protecting my time where I talk to him through prayer. And if in my life I recognize that my personal Bible study time is reduced because of my busyness, and my personal prayer time is reduced because of my busyness, I need to pump the brakes and evaluate and see what I can do to carve out the devil's not going to carve out that time for me. Nobody else can carve out that time for me. But I have to find some way of making some arrangement, whether I put a message on my phone that alerts me. In some fashion, it's up to me to practice the self-discipline that says, Roger, if you want to grow spiritually the way you need to grow, Bubba, 
you need to have prayer time and study time. It's up to me to make sure that happens. Here's the third thing that happens when our busyness is overwhelming us. We don't seem to have time to encourage our brothers and sisters. We, we see them at services, but, but in terms of encouragement and exhortation and personal connection, that's fallen off the radar. I know they're busy, I know I'm busy, but you know what? We still need each other, right? And so the message of, of Hebrews 3 and verse 13 is exhort one another daily. You know what it takes in order to do that? Some kind of connection. Now you, may t you may connect by text. You may connect by email. You may connect by phone. You may connect in person. What, what, but there needs to be connection. And if I see in my life that my connection with other Christians is basically, it's not only minimal, it's almost non-existent. They need to pump the brakes and see about making an adjustment. What about my time devoted to assembling with the saints? If my busyness is preventing me from assembling with the saints to worship the creator of the universe and to be in Bible classes with my brothers and sisters, if my busyness is affecting me, it's not in my best interest. If I am seeking first the Lord's cause, then I'm going to make arrangements to be present for those assembled as much as possible. There, there are things that happen in life that are out of our control. The Lord knows that. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's not only before we get to the assembly, that's part of the assembly, that's part of that being together stirring up one another and provoking in a good way, exhorting one another, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what else suffers in our busyness? You don't have to tell me. I know it happens. I know it happens. Our personal evangelism suffers. And we are so caught up in our busyness and again, that business may be in wholesome things. If I'm too busy to try to talk to lost people about the gospel, you know what I am? I'm too busy. A number of years ago, brother and the Lord wasn't present for the assembly, and after the assembly, we were out in a public place and came across him, and we were said, "Well, we missed you this morning, so I was I was too busy to come, Bubba." If you're too busy to attend the assemblies of the saints, you're just that. You're too busy. If you're too busy to study your Bible on your own, you're too busy. If you're too busy to take time to pray, you're too busy. If you're too busy to evangelize and try to t teach lost people about how to go to heaven, you are too busy. And the only one in my life who can bring the reins in on that... Is me. So those are some signs that our super business is affecting us. Let me think about some cases where our commitment to the Lord's put to the test. Perhaps you've encountered this. Some of us have. If not, you might. If you never do, uh, God bless you. But a lot of us are from families where either a small portion or a large portion or the whole thing, they're not members of God's family. And so in their mind, when it's mama's birthday or it's a national holiday and the family gets together at time X and the Ironiton church also assembles at time X, in their way of thinking, well, the only natural choice is to be what? Mama's birthday party. And they will not be happy campers if you don't share 
that kind of thinking. And if you don't fall in line and do that. Jesus said if we love father more, father, mother, family members more than we love him, we're, we're not worthy of him. Matthew 10, 37, or in the language of Luke 14, it's we can't be his disciples. It's not, you choose for the rest of your life. Are you going to love your family? Are you going to love the Lord? It's not that choice. It's a matter of what? First things first. Or here I am, I'm a, I'm a student. Maybe I'm a ball player. And they're supposed to be a student activity, whether it's ball game or whatever, at time X. And it just so happens the congregation where I'm a member has a Bible study or a worship assembly at time X. Where are my priorities going to be? My priorities need to be I'm going to be with God's people. So I'm not sure my coach would understand. Well, we'll try to help them. We're not going to be ugly about it, but we'll try to help them understand. I've known of young men and young women who are in that type of situation and they spoke to their coach or they spoke to a teacher or administration from the school who were over that activity. You might be surprised. Here's the thing. James said, we have not because we ask not. <laughs> but I've known some young men and women who've been in that situation. They went and talked with the, through the proper channels and the message came back said, God bless you. I wish I had more kids on my team. I wish I had more kids in my class. Like you. Another time we might be tested is in our financial contributions. You know, Malachi was a prophet of God in a time when some in the Jewish community were struggling. I don't mean they were struggling financially, but they were struggling in, in their attitudes and their approaches. And in Malachi chapter 3, we read that God made one of his accusations, and the accusations was... You've robbed me. Now, it didn't mean that they passed the collection plate or the collection basket and people were taking money out of the basket and putting it in the pot. That no, wasn't what was happening. God said, you're, you're robbing from me, you're stealing from me in tithes and offerings. What that meant was, what should have gone to God was staying in their pocket. What should have gone to God was staying with them. And God's promise, you might even say God's challenge to the Jews of Malachi's time was, look, you bring your tithes and you bring your offerings properly and you just watch and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. God said, you put me first. God said, you do what you ought to do and you just don't see. Just, just watch and see if I'll not bless you. God's not asking us to go broke. God's not asking us to be bankrupt. But when it comes to our financial contributions, God wants us to put first things first. Now, I may have had some amens, at least in your minds, but I may lose them now. In my choice of job slash career, my commitment of first things first is going to be put to a test. It's beyond my wildest imaginations how a child of the living God could pursue a job or career which they know in advance good, they know good and well. that that job is not going to allow them to be present for Bible study and worship except maybe 20% of the time. And I've talked with Christians and I say, I got a new job. I say, well, what kind of work schedule are you going to have? Well, I don't know. I didn't ask. Didn't ask. So I got to provide for my family and God knows that and God bless you for doing that. But we've also got to believe in God's promise if we put Him first. What? He's going to provide for our needs. Hey, Brother Roger, I've got a job. It's over in, uh, and they named the place. They said, well, 
what, what do you know about the congregation? I, I think the closest one is three hours away. You know what's physically possible? It's physically possible for a person to live in a place and put in the effort to travel three hours one way to go to services. I know people who have done it and do it now. But you know what? You know what that does on a person? It wears on them. It wears on them mentally. It wears on them physically. And to think before traveling down that road that this is going to be in my spiritual best interest, brethren, that's just not true. Not only would it be in our choice of jobs and where those jobs are and what those jobs are, where they are and what they are, what about the spouse whom we choose? It's in our spiritual best interest. And if we have children together, it's in the best interest of my children that I marry someone who's on the same page as me spiritually. Not just on the same page as me, but on the same page as God. I need to marry somebody who loves God more than they love me. I need to marry somebody who's going to help me go to heaven. Because I don't care what language you use. If I marry somebody whose devotion is not to the King of kings and Lord of lords, then the only other alternative is their devotion is to the devil. If I marry someone like that, that's not in my spiritual. But you say, Brother Campbell, don't you know that through the years there have been a lot of people who have been converted or they converted their spouse? I know that's the case. But my commitment to the Lord in first things first is put to a test when I make a choice of spouse. Let's close out this morning with a few positive things. Look in your Bible, if you would, in 1 Corinthians 7. I've got three or four things, and then we're done. Here are some suggestions. Number one, we begin with this thought. The most important thing in my life is to live my life in such a way that when my life on earth is done, my eternal destination is going to be heaven. And that must mean more to me than anything else in the world. Let me ask you all a question. Is your life a success? If you did not live long enough to come back to our assembly at 1.30 and you left this world, would your life go down as a success? You say, well, 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 I'm not sure. You know, the world looks at success, well, it has its own way of looking, right? Material possessions, notoriety, some special legacy. But the Lord's definition of success, it's way different. After Moses died and God was speaking to Joshua to encourage him to step up and, and fill that role of leading them across into the land of promise, he said, you know what? He says, you, you don't turn, when it comes to my law, you don't turn to the right hand, you don't turn to the left hand, you stay with it and you do that. He said, you'll have success and you'll prosper. On the day of judgment, King Jesus will do the talking. And to some people, King Jesus will say, depart from me. You can just put right there beside that failure. That's a failed life. And to some people, Jesus, King Jesus will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And you can put beside that success. Now my attitude and my mindset needs to be, I'm going to be a success in life. Which means regardless of what happens, I want to live my life in such a way that I go to heaven. Now, I gave you all that time to find 1 Corinthians 7. Did you find it? You thought the preacher forgot. 1 Corinthians 7, it's, it's a chapter about marriage. And so what Paul is writing here is specifically about marriage. But here's a principle. Look in your Bible in chapter 7 and verse number 35, 35. 
And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord, New King James, serve the Lord, look at those last words, without distraction. There was some type of distress that was going on at that time that, that we don't know what it was they did. But Paul said, as you're thinking about, as you're contemplating getting married, he said, what I want for you is whatever your choice is, to be married or not be married, that you're able to serve the Lord without distraction. Brethren, that's be our mindset. My goal is to go to heaven. And I'll not allow anything to distract me from that goal. Number two, do some personal inventories. We're thinking about our super busyness. Evaluate your life. Take the time, okay? Take the time. Write it down somehow. Make a record. How are you spending your time? You say, well, I feel like my Bible study is kind of off, and my prayer is a little off, and my involvement with other Christians is off, and personal it's, it's off. So, okay, take the time. Make a record for a week or a month. How are you using your time? Once you do that, don't stop there. <laughs> Analyze and say, where can I make some adjustments that would be beneficial to me? Don't stop there. Because right now all you've got is what? You've got analysis and intentions. Now then where the faith has to step in to take that analysis and intentions and put them into practice. Thirdly, you might want to consider speaking with a mature Christian for whom you have the highest level of respect. Say, look, Sister Jones, Br Brother Smith, you know me, you see my life. Do you think that my busyness is affecting my spiritual life or you just look at my busy life and say, well, that's the way it is for all Americans? Get some feedback. And then finally, Make a special effort, make a concentrated effort to improve your communication with God. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Make a special effort. It doesn't have to be New Year's re re resolution. It could be a February 5th. I just want to do better resolution. Make a special effort to spend more time studying. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to us, James 4 and verse 8. So, those are some thoughts about the challenge to keep first things first in our busy life. Look, if somebody told you this being a Christian is easy peasy, they weren't telling you straight. It's not easy. Doable. That's why we need each other to encourage each other. We've not talked this morning how to become a child of the living God, but by God's grace... Salvation is available and the blood of Jesus has the power to wash away every sin you've ever committed. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're ready to turn from your sins in repentance, confess your faith and be immersed in water for the remission of sins will be the best day of your life. We could do that before you left this building and you would be a member of God's family and you would be heaven bound. Or maybe here's a child of God and you need the prayers of the saints. It's heaven's invitation. Would you come as you stand with me?
Be seated, please. If you didn't pick up your serving of the Lord's Supper, that when you came in, would you raise your hand and someone will bring you a serving now? Turn, please, to number 58. 58. <clears throat> On the night that the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper for us, he went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, the text says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. The cup that he speaks of is the cup of suffering. From that moment, he being in agony knew that there was going to be a crowd that was going to come and take him, that he was going to be mocked, ridiculed, he was going to be beaten, he was going to suffer death on the cross. That cup of suffering led to what the Apostle Paul calls in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 16, the cup of blessing. The text says, the cup of blessing which we bless, 
Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Great suffering led to great blessings. As we partake of this cup this morning, let us reflect back upon the suffering that it took to bring about all of our spiritual blessings. Bow with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we come to you at this time in communion. As we prepare our minds for this, let us remove all worldly things and focus upon the cross and the body that was hung upon that cross to pay our sins. But Father, may we also look back further than the cross and look at the life that Jesus led, setting the perfect example for us that if we will only follow that example, then we can be the beneficiaries of that body that was hung upon the cross. And it's in your son's name we ask these things. Amen. Let us give thanks for the blood. Okay. Father, again, we come to you thanking you for this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents the blood that your son shed upon the cross, the only thing that will remove sins from our lives. May we take this cup in a worthy manner and pleasing unto you. It's in your son's holy name we ask these things. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Separate apart from the Lord's Supper, we've been instructed to lay by in store as we've been prospered. This being a convenient time, there is a plate here in the front and there's one on each table in the back of the auditorium where you can leave your contribution. Let us give thanks for the blessings at this time. Our most righteous God and Holy Father, we, we again come before thee we're thankful, Father, for our health, for our ability to earn a livelihood, and we're thankful, Father, for all the many blessings. We pray, Father, that we can return a portion of these blessings back to thee at this time in a manner that's well pleasing in thy sight. For these things we ask in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Perhaps it's been maybe the last three to five years, I'm not exactly sure, that I have started in planning our lectureship, I've started giving a lot of latitude to our speakers in their own selection of their topics. And the biggest danger in that is that you worry about overlapping, and so we've had to work to avoid that at times. But when Brother Rogers submitted to me his topics for today, I knew they were topics that would benefit all of us, Cliff Goodwin included. And just like I said last night, following those sessions, I was challenged, and I've been challenged here today. Thank you, Brother Roger, so much for coming and being with us. You know, one quote he said that I'm going to remember, it, it hit me right between the eyes when he said it. He said, the devil doesn't have to get us to go into false religion. He doesn't have to get us to practice rampant immorality. He doesn't have to get us to blaspheme the name of the Lord. He simply has to distract us, emphasizing the material over the spiritual. We all need to be reminded of that. We are so blessed to have you here today. Everybody look around. Right now, look around the people around you. I'll wait till I see heads turning. Look around. 
All right, there are visitors. There are a lot of visitors with us. So for our members here at Ironiton, following our dismissal prayer, go to a visitor that's seated close to you. Introduce yourself if you don't know each other already. Lovingly take them by the arm and say, come on, get in line with me. And we want our visitors toward the, the front of the line. We'll be forming the line for our meal at these double doors up here at the front following our dismissal prayer. And so please look around and, and help us with that. Instead of interrupting the meal as, as we're enjoying it here in a few minutes together, I want to take care of some things right now. Uh, we extend a hearty thank you, a hearty thank you to Sister Alice Blankenship. When you go next door, you're going to be blown away once again uh, by the way it has been set up for us. And, and Alice has already told me that she wants to make sure that we thank Rodney and Rita Williams, Ravonda Stevens, who also helped, these who also helped with the setting up. And Alice also wanted to thank our young men who Wednesday night saw to it that the tables and the chairs were put in place. And we're truly indebted to all of you for helping make this meal even more special. Now on those tables you're going to see Valentine's care baskets. They have chocolate and fruit in the baskets. And as you know, Miss Alice intends that these get taken following today's services. Find a shut-in, find someone in assisted living, find someone recovering from surgery, find someone whose day needs to be brightened and uh, deliver those Valentine's care baskets to them. And also there are snow globe vases, likewise, that may help to lift someone's day. And so those are intended to be taken. Take those and find someone that we can bless with the gifts of those items. Okay, one other announcement. Uh, this year, as happens a lot of years during February, because of the marriage retreat and because of the challenge, our singing night will be moved one week back. So just keep in mind, this Wednesday we'll be in classes this Wednesday, and our singing night will be February 15th. Uh, later this month. That's all I have. We'll be uh, enjoying this meal together and then we'll reconvene at 1.30 for our final service of the day. If you would, let's be standing and Brother Michael come dismiss us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come here today and, and worship you. Father, we pray that everything we have done today has been acceptable in your sight. Father, we thank you for Roger and his family for being here and for the two lessons that he has presented. Father, we, we pray for all those on our, in our bulletin list or that is announced as been, being sick. Pray for, for, for everyone here. And Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity to go next door and partake of the fellowship meal. Father, we thank you for all those that have uh, prepared meals, and we pray that that food goes to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to your service. Be with us. Keep us safe. Thank you for Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen.